Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us at the uh, World Trade Center Oculus. Uh, I'm proud to, uh, today to announce that our mask force is expanding its reach. Uh, the Port Authority is represented by Executive Director Rick Cotton today, New Jersey Transit represented by Kevin Corbett, President and CEO, Amtrak rep represented by Steve Predmore, Chief Safety Officer, and SEPTA, uh, Leslie Richards, the uh, President and CEO, will uh, be appearing remotely. All those agencies have come together committed to joining our efforts to promote mass usage, uh, mass usage on public transit uh, and expanding the mask force. Together, we can keep the New York, New Jersey region safe as uh, coronavirus cases spike across the nation. Masks remain an essential tool in fighting this once-in-a-century pandemic. All health experts agree that wearing a mask is the most important thing each of us can do to limit the spread of COVID-19 and minimize health risk to our employees and our customers. Our agencies individually and collectively are doing everything we can to protect public health. But it's crucial that every mass transit rider does his or her part too. And that means wearing a mask. And in New York, it's the law. Those who refuse to wear a mask in the MTA system face a $50 fine. Thankfully, to date, we've only had to issue 10 summonses in, in thousands of encounters. In most cases, commuters have either put their mask on or adjusted it properly to cover their face when approached by police or MTA staff. We're proud that the vast majority of MTA customers already cover up. Our most recent surveys show that mask compliance on subways and buses and commuter rail in the MTA system is above 95% but we're not going to be satisfied until there's universal mask compliance. Frankly, there's no excuse not to wear a mask. To date, thanks to generous gener donations from the, MTA, uh, from the state and the city to the MTA, we have distributed more than 15 million masks to employees and our customers. Our mask force volunteers have personally distributed over 300,000 of those masks to customers. Masks are also available from dispensers on buses and at station booths, and PPE vending machines have been installed in a number of stations. With COVID face, uh, cases rising nationwide, this is not the time to get lax. The mass force mission is more important than ever, and the MTA has been ne never better prepared to fight the pandemic. Our measures include millions of masks and pairs of gloves distributed, extensive disinfection on trains and buses and in stations and offices, that subways, buses, Metro North and Long Island Railroad, on-site COVID, voluntary COVID screenings, aggressive contract tracing, barriers for our bus operators and innovative air filtration on commuter railroads. Before I finish, I wanna recognize MTA Chief Customer Officer, Sarah Meyer, who's with us today, who's a genius. She's the creator of the Mass Force. This initiative was her idea, and thanks to Sarah's hard work and that of her team, it's been a massive success. And today, we're expanding it with our sister agencies. With that, I'll turn the podium over to Rick Cotton, the Executive Director of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Rick. Thank you, Pat. It's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues, uh, Pat from the MTA, Kevin Corbett from New Jersey Transit, our friends from Amtrak, and my colleague, uh, my colleague Clarell de Graff from PATH. Uh, keeping the traveling public safe is the Port Authority's top priority. And we are literally here today to save lives to, to stop the spread of the virus and to protect and ask everyone to cooperate in protecting each other from the virus. And there is no single act that anyone can do more powerful than wearing a mask whenever they are within public transit, whenever they are inside, indeed, every place they go. Now, as part of what the Port Authority has been about. We've worked aggressively to keep our facilities clean, sanitized, 
and capable of accommodating passengers by enabling them to maintain a safe social distance. In addition, the agency has been laser focused on helping customers comply with our facility's wide mask policy. Agency regulations make it mandatory to wear face coverings whenever and wherever people are in our facilities. That applies to PATH, it applies to the airports, it applies to the bus terminal, it applies to the every single facility that the Port Authority operates. And as of the beginning of this month, anyone who is not complying with that mandate is subject to a $50 fine. We have been active in helping our customers, helping our riders, helping passengers at the airports to comply with that regulation. To date, the Port Authority has distributed more than 736,000 masks. We have held a total of 28 mask giveaways, mask education events, including today, where we distribute masks to riders, to customers, to passengers. Those events have been at the Midtown Bus Terminal, the George Washington Bridge Bus Station, Pass Stations, the World Trade Center. By the way, I would like to welcome everyone to the Oculus and to the World Trade Center. These giveaways have occurred during the morning and evening rush hours at each of the facilities to maximize impact, and we began doing this in July. With the holiday season, we're stepping up our mask distribution efforts. We will be holding mask giveaways every day this week, and we will be holding mask giveaways at every airport in the course of next week. The agency reports voluntary compliance with mask wearing at, is well over 95% across our facilities. The PAPD, our police department, has had an estimated 44,000 interactions with members of the public who are not wearing a mask. The vast majority of these interactions have ended with travelers putting on a face covering, either one of their own or one given to them by a police department officer. To date, the Port Authority has issued five summonses for refusal to wear a mask across all of our facilities. We are committed to continuing to take every single step that we can to keep travelers safe and we are highly focused and ask everyone to cooperate in wearing a mask whenever they are in a Port Authority facility. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kevin Corbett of New Jersey Transit. Thank you, Rick, and uh, thank you, Pat, and thanks, everyone, for coming here. It is great to be uh, in the Oculus today. When you think of where we were back in March and April, and the level of activity when everything's been shut down. It's great to see people coming back to stores. People, the average rider, where they could take New Jersey Transit to PATH, PATH to MTA. For those of us who are regularly in this area, we all know you're constantly going from one mode to the other. And that's why I think it really is a powerful message that all three of us are together saying, whichever system you're riding, it doesn't matter. Please wear the mask. If people are coming back, it's great. Uh, similar to what uh, Pat and Rick said at New Jersey Transit, we've taken extraordinary measures. We sanitize all vehicles every day. Uh, we have uh, you know, daily cleaning of all the uh, hot spots and certain spots, even more our busy, uh, busy facilities multiple times a day. Um, but it really is a shared responsibility. We need riders. We will do our part. We are uh, similarly in coordinating, uh, not just with the MTA and Port Authority, but nationally and internationally. We have associations we're involved with that look at Singapore, Hong Kong, Berlin. We share all that data and information of best practices, and we're all doing various research. New Jersey Transit's working closely with Rutgers Kate on uh, whether it be UV or other disinfection technologies to make sure that we have the safest, cleanest possible ride. But it really does put it back on, on the riders as well to do their share, that shared responsibility. And that is, if you are sick, please stay home. Uh, you're not doing anybody a favor by trying to go to work or do something when you're sick. Um, and otherwise, if you're coming, any of our facilities, uh, any of our uh, bus, light rail, or rail, uh, make sure you have a mask on. And that is the single most important act you can do to prevent the spread of the virus. 
Uh, we, we are glad to have people coming back. We see ridership starting to uh, come back. Um, but it is really important that uh, people do, do wear the mask. Uh, our, our police force, New Jersey Transit Police Force, has had over 1,600 uh, 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 sorties with uh, promoting the uses of a mask, making sure we're doing inspections, as well as just normal uh, practice. All our officers have masks. Our bus drivers and uh, our major terminals and facilities have masks. They need them, so there's no excuse not to have them. And we know that it, we know about COVID fatigue. I think all of us feel it one time or the other. But uh, there, there's no excuse. This is with the winter coming. This is a perfect time. Just keep the mask on. You go about your safe riding transit. But it's important that we keep reinforcing that message. Uh, and working together, we we can definitely succeed in slowing the spread as we get life back to uh, normal. As we look forward in going into the new year. Um, glad to be part of the Mass Force, and again, thanks to Pat, Sarah, and Rick for that. Uh, would also like to say that it's not just uh, in, uh, in the region, we also have uh, Amtrak as partners for all of us as well. And I'd like to, uh, with that, uh, turn it over to Amtrak's Chief Safety Officer, Steve uh, Predmore. Steve? Thank you, Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Predmore, the Executive Vice President and Chief Safety Officer for Amtrak. And on behalf of Amtrak, I, and uh, I'd like to uh, extend our thanks to our partners who've come together at MTA, New Jersey Transit, Port Authority of New York, and New Jersey, PATH, and SEPTA uh, for today's Mask Force of Palooza event to highlight the importance of wearing a mask and sharing the same commitment that Amtrak has made to customer and employee safety. As Chief Safety Officer of Amtrak, I'm extremely proud of the efforts uh, our team has made to keep our trains and stations clean uh, over the last few months. Uh, this includes working with our new partner, uh, RB, the makers of Lysol products, and also partnering with George Washington University Millikan School Institute School of Public Health, an extraordinary group of faculty and students who are providing us with the best guidance around public health improvement. Through this support and these partnerships, we've uh, completely revamped our operation from beginning to end and are providing a new standard of safe travel in these very challenging times. That's what Amtrak's doing, but the one thing that's been very clear that we all need to do now is to wear a mask and to wear it properly. It can be one of the, it's one of the things that makes the most difference in reducing the spread of COVID-19 and it protects uh, ourselves and those around us. For Amtrak, that means that it is our policy and we require all customers and, our, and employees to wear a face mask or covering that fully covers the entire mouth and nose and fits snugly against the side of the face and secures under the chin at all times while on board or in our stations unless you're actively eating or drinking. In addition, based on the best guidance that we have, neck gaiters, open uh, chin, uh, triangle bandanas, mask containing valves, all of those are not appropriate and proper wear. And over the course of the next few weeks as we go into the travel season, you'll see increased signage and announcements in our stations about wearing masks, wearing them properly, and what constitutes a proper mask. Additionally, as we go into the holiday travel season, our, our Amtrak ambassadors, which is part of the Amtrak experience during this time of year, will have masks available to hand out to customers. So if you don't have a mask, if you don't have the proper mask, or your mask breaks, we've got you covered. It's important that we all look out for each other and do our part. As someone whose entire job is all about safety, it's important for me to share the message on the importance of wearing a mask in trains and stations, but you'll hear it from every Amtrak employee, and I'm sure you'll hear it from all the employees from every organization represented here today. And we stand here together in collaboration, uh, as well as individual companies, uh, to communicate and enforce these policies. And if we can do that, uh, we'll all be safer, and, uh, uh, and, and, and we'll, we'll be able to reverse this trend that we're experiencing right now. Thank you. Pat? Thank you, Steve. Now we're going to hear from Leslie Richards, who's the president of SEPTA, uh, which runs the transit system in, the, in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area. Thanks, Pat. It's great to be here announcing Mask Force Philly as the general manager of SEPTA, the transit authority serving the greater Philadelphia region, including parts of New Jersey and Delaware. This second wave is proving to be a formidable opponent. To beat it, all of us need to do our part. 
That starts by recognizing that wearing a mask for another facial covering in public and specifically on public transit is quite simply the best thing any of us can do. It's the single most powerful weapon we have against the virus. It greatly reduces the risk to you, your friends, your coworkers, and your loved ones, as well as many others you may not know and encounter daily in stores and elsewhere. For all of these reasons, I am proud to announce today that SEPTA will be joining with our peer transit and railroad agencies in the Northeast to launch SEPTA Mass Force Philly early next year. This effort expands on our successful social distancing coaches program where SEPTA employee volunteers engage customers about our face mask requirement and give tips for social distancing at stations and on vehicles to promote safe and healthy travel habits. SEPTA customers have already stepped up and shown they care. Today, on average, about 90% of all customers on our buses, trains, and trolleys are wearing a mask properly every day, and we cannot afford to let up. Mask Force Philly will be reaching out to all riders with tips about how to properly wear a mask, to offer a mask to those without one, and to provide a complimentary mask to anyone who wishes to have one as a backup so that they never are left unprotected. SEPTA has been and continues to be an essential service that riders can count on. Our system is clean, it's safe, and through the toughest times, we ride on. Pat, back to you. Leslie, thanks. Uh, and our last speaker is going to be a, a former colleague of mine, uh, Clarell DeGraff, who is the Director and General Manager of PATH. Clarell. Thank you, Pat. Uh, just really wanted an opportunity to say good morning to everyone, and thank you so much for joining all of us here. And I think it's a, a great day where you would see the executives of the major transportation agencies of this region take, a, take time off to be here to say how important wearing a mask is. We know from our health departments, we know from the CDC, that wearing a mask is a powerful tool against this virus that has close to decimated our country. Uh, and having the executives here to, to demonstrate the importance to be here uh, is, is, um, is a very important thing. So we just really want to thank you and remind you to please wear your mask and wear it properly. Thank you. Some of your uh, uh, colleagues mentioned wearing a mask properly. I know you've said you've got 95% compliance on the MTA, but one of the things we see on social media is folks who've got it like this, not wearing it the right way. Are those riders subject to a possible summons? And why would you say that there have only been 10 summonses handed out since you started? Well, let, let me address the last question first, Andrew. Uh, first. I think the media today that joined us over at Fulton Street and here at the World Trade Center Oculus observed what our statistics show, which is the overwhelming majority of our customers are wearing a mask. And the demand for additional masks is people, people want them, so that's one. Two is what happens when an MTA employee enters a car, police officer, NYPD or MTA police, uh, someone not wearing a mask who has one will put it on. They'll adjust it accordingly. And our goal is not to raise revenue or to issue summonses. Our goal is to have people wear the mask appropriately. The third point I would make is that part of Sarah Meyer's plan here, and you've seen the signage on subways and buses and subway stations, is the correct way to wear a mask. So we're addressing that directly. And the other agencies that are here today, and they can each speak for themselves, are, are doing the same thing. Uh, I, I think that the mass compliance that we've reported and that each of them spoke today uh, is an incredibly important, uh, uh, it's the single most important thing any customer can do in terms of protecting themselves, the CDC affirms that now, in terms of protecting their fellow commuters and our employees. Yeah, 
it, Pat, along those lines, what is the, per you said 95% mask compliance, what is the percentage of mask users who are not wearing their masks properly? And then just to tack on to Andrew's question, in terms of, um, you know, visual signs on trains telling riders to wear their masks, is there something you're looking into separate from filling ad space? Are there other places where you could put those reminders so that um, it doesn't require a police officer or an MTA employee on the train to get everybody up to Yeah, compliance? look, I, I, I mentioned the signage that Sarah Meyer and her team came, came up with in terms of wearing masks correctly. There are also announcements on buses, on, on subways. The out front signage, the electric signage in the subways has the, 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 the message, you got to wear a mask, there's a fine if you don't, and here's how to wear it correctly. And we're also incredibly active on social media getting the message out. And I think a sign, the sign of success is the fact that we're reporting these high levels of mass compliance and relatively small numbers uh, of summonses. The, uh, those who wear mass compliance, it, it, it averages, but it's 10% or below. And as I said earlier, our goal is to have universal mass compliance and that means everybody wearing a mask and wearing it correctly. Okay, well, this is a question for, for Pat, for Rick Cotton, for Mr. Corbett from NJ Transit and all of you. Everybody's wondering, you all have deficits because of the pandemic and because of a loss of ridership. And everybody is hoping that you get a stimulus package from Washington. Whether you get all or part of it remains to be seen. But if you get extra money, will there still have to be fair and toll hikes of various services, specifically to the MTA? Will you be able to resume 24-hour service? So there's a whole bunch of questions uh, in there, Marcia. So le let me address the 24-hour service. We we've been clear from the beginning since May 6th when we instituted the 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. closure uh, that the closure would continue because it is so important and pivotal to being able to disinfect every car and every station that it would continue during the, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic is obviously uh, still here and in some parts of the country uh, unfortunately, uh, r r raging. Uh, with respect to the uh, finances, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Rick and, and Kevin uh, Corbett for them to, uh, to weigh in, I would say the following. The uh, election of the uh, president-elect is a, a very positive step. Uh, every school child in the country knows that, uh, you know, he's called Amtrak Joe and that he wrote it regularly between Wilmington and uh, Washington, D.C. when he was a, a senator and it, it, throughout his entire career has been an ardent supporter of mass transit and public transit. That's a positive. Uh, obviously, the arm of the government, the part of the branch of the government that uh, stood in the way of the HEROES Act and other financing after CARES uh, in the spring was the United States uh, Senate, uh, led by uh, Senator uh, McConnell. Uh, I, I, I don't have any perspective into what's going to happen with respect to the Georgia runoff uh, races, but it is not clear. It, it is not clear that there's a clear path to funding, speaking just for the MTA, in the amount of $12 billion, which is uh, what we need. And I'll turn it over to Rick. And One more. So does that mean that you're still looking at fare hikes and toll hikes for the MTA? Well, look. As we've said, uh, no one at the MTA wants to reduce service or lay off any of our heroic colleagues, period. No one wants to do that. Our hand may be forced if the federal government doesn't come through with the funding. Uh, we will be discussing uh, these issues at our board meeting tomorrow and in December. Uh, and I, I think it would be inappropriate for me to get ahead of the board and the public discussion tomorrow. Well, let me speak uh, to the continuing devastation of the Port Authority's revenue lines by the pandemic. Our airports are still down 75% in terms of passengers from pre-COVID levels. Our PATH commuter railroad system is still down 75% from pre-COVID levels. Traffic over our bridges and tunnels down 15%. 
that level of decline in terms of our riders and passengers simply is at this point uh, costing us $150 million of lost revenue every single month. We are currently approaching 1.3, a little north of $1.3 billion in, in lost revenue in just the eight months since the virus began. Our estimate over two years is that we will lose $3 billion worth of revenue. There is no way that the agency can make up that degree of revenue loss. We have gone to Washington and asked for $3 billion of federal aid to fill in that hole. If we do not get that, we will be forced to significantly reduce, significantly reduce our capital plan and cut back on our capital spending. That is a terrible thing, enormously counterproductive for the region. It means that our infrastructure will not be upgraded, and even more importantly, it means that we will be cutting back at exactly the time that the region needs the, a desperately an economic recovery. We want to contribute to that economic recovery. It requires Washington to come to the table. The stalemate that has existed up to now within the Congress and with the administration on an additional stimulus bill is just a tragedy for the nation. It's a tragedy for the region. We are hopeful that with the election of President-elect Biden that the dynamic will change. We know that he is in a champion of improved infrastructure and he's a champion of transit. But it will require uh, the cooperation of the Congress. But we look forward to working with the new administration. We look forward to working with the Congress and we will continue to advocate for critically needed federal funding as we have. Thank you. And Marcia, from uh, on the New Jersey side, uh, certain similarities, obviously, with, with, with Pat and Rick. But, you know, for us, we have enough CARES Act funding that will get us through till next May, June, which is our fiscal year. But we really have to start looking after that. It's who goes over the waterfall and the canoe, uh, who's first ahead of, of the other. So it is obviously a great concern for us. Uh, we have done a lot with... Uh, you know, since the pandemic hit, where we had, uh, you know, we were a single-digit ridership on both bus and rail, light rail. Uh, you know, bus, we had rear door entry, so we weren't collecting fares like Pat, and we coordinated with Pat on what's the best practice to make, make sure we protect our workforce, but to get the riders back coming in, collecting the fares through the front door and by having the protection for, ri for the bus drivers, et cetera, operators. Uh, so we, we've done a, a lot to try to, to uh, minimize financial impact, but uh, interestingly, in New Jersey, our uh, intrastate bus is now back to 70 percent. We see a lot of people back and uh, being responsible, uh, even self-policing. We do a lot of our own policing, but people, you know, sort of like quiet cars if they see somebody not wearing a mask. So we've done a lot, of, a lot to make sure that people feel comfortable coming back. But we really see coming into New York particularly, uh, the Port Authority bus terminal, as Rick knows, we're at about 35 percent on the interstate into New York. And on our passenger rail, very similar to I know what Pat and his team see, we're at about 20, 22, 23 percent of uh, ridership. So we really need till New York comes back. We know that for essential workers, I think everyone saw how people used our system and how vital it was. And we still see that playing a role as the economy comes back. Um, but without that funding, it's a catch-22. People want to have as much uh, social distancing on our buses and trains as possible. So that means having the, you know, the maximum frequency, keeping that you know, sort of regular service frequency, uh, while having that less ridership and less ridership revenue. So that will be critical gap. And I think a really uh, key point that Rick brought up is the impact. One of the most insidious things for anybody who's in the transit industry is seeing when you start raiding your seed, eating your seed corn, you raid your capital to cover your operating. New Jersey Transit, I, you know, I've spent the last two and a half years since I got there digging out from a decade of disinvestment and raiding our capital, and it had just, you know, really devastating uh, impact on New Jersey Transit. So we are finally getting, uh, getting out from under that. Uh, we have a five-year capital plan, but it has a $5 billion uh, gap. We're lucky this year we have about $2.3 billion in projects underway, and then Portal Bridge, which we just secured, that's another $1.8 billion. So right now we're very busy, and to Rick's point, this is a great time when the market's a bit soft 
you know, where it was overheated before, to be getting capital projects that are needed. These are investments that last decades, if not centuries, as we've seen with some of these bridges. So this is a time to be investing. And my concern, I share the optimism, but I also am a little bit concerned that there's so much optimism that we are competing traditionally, even when there's uh, funding and more generous Congress, and more generous White House, uh, they also tend to be more generous to everyone else. So we're fighting for funding with healthcare, education, and a lot of other things. So even if there's more uh, enthusiasm, I'm concerned we have to make sure we have really strong advocacy in Washington to make sure the transit, because we are the underpinning of, of the economy and the economic recovery, both on operating capital. So we're going to be have, fighting very hard to make sure uh, that is, uh, is not just the intent, but also that at the end of the day, we get that funding. Pardon? Fair hikes? No, I think this is a, would be the worst time, and that's up to uh, Governor Murphy. Uh, and I think he's you know, very concerned, is uh, both about rating capital to operating, but also to make sure that uh, the people who are most impacted are the, the essential workers. So to be hitting them with a fair increase, uh, you know, to me, would not be, that'd be the last thing we'd want to do. And particularly for New Jersey Transit, with the people suffered for us as we made some painful uh, decisions to finally get back to where we're operating smoothly and have good routine service. So you know, to hit them with a fair increase right now would be the last thing I'd want to do. I mean, as Marcia pointed out, you're all looking for heaps of money from Congress, but a new presidential administration could also mean unlocking of new start funds for the MTA. Rick, it could mean new guidance from DHS at the airports. Um, Pat, you're, the MTA is presenting a budget tomorrow. Um, has the lack of progress with the presidential transition had any impact on your financial planning? And Rick, has it had any impact on the way that you're planning your oper operations for next year? The question is whether the delay in transition has any impact. Uh, the, the answer is from an MTA point of view, the delay in transition, I can't speak on what effect it's had on the new, on the president-elect and his team. From our po point of view, so far, no. Well, let me begin by saying every single facility of the Port Authority is open, operating. We're committed to maintain first-class operations now and going into the future. The challenge for us is $3 billion worth of lost revenue within a 24-month period is something that the agency itself cannot fill in. Therefore, we're forced to go to D.C. We normally don't go to D.C. We're forced in this instance to go to D.C. to ensure that we're able to build the infrastructure that we've committed to build and that which it has been provided for in our capital plan. Delay from Washington is simply going to be delay for our ability to move forward. And at some point that becomes highly, highly problematic. So I can't speak specifically to the transition, but the law, if we do not get federal support, it will have real world consequences in terms of our ability to rebuild the infrastructure, to build new, to build world class infrastructure, which is what the region requires. So we are delaying decisions. We have put projects that are not in construction on pause until we understand what D.C. is or is not going to do, and we need clarity and we need it as soon as possible. 